Welcome to Spotlight on Broadway. I'm Pat Collins, and we're here at CUNY TV's Hyman Brown Studio. My guests for the next half hour know everything there is to know about Broadway, the Tony Awards, and theater in general. Heather Hitchens is president and CEO of the American Theater Wing, and Patrick Pacheco is an Emmy-winning commentator and editor of American uh, Theater Wing and oral history. So oral suggests that you interviewed a lots and lots of people. Who did you interview? That is very true. Actually, in our very first meeting, uh, Heather and I decided that this should be an oral history, partially because I love the Studs Terkel oral histories so much, and also I thought it was the best way the, for the voices to become alive. So, uh, so it was both the posthumous voices, because obviously founded in 1917, there was about a half a century of voices that we wanted in the book that uh, obviously are no longer with us. And then the second half of the century, of course, were artists who continued to sustain exactly what the American Theatre Wing meant to the theatre. And many so, of them still alive. And yeah. many of them still alive. So of the living voices, uh, about, I'd say, 80 to 90 living voices I interviewed in the course of this project. And then through the uh, research at the Library of Performing Arts, going through these large, dusty, crumbling volumes and uh, 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 scrapbooks of the American Theatre Wing, uh, these voices, of uh, these posthumous voices came alive urgently and with a great story to tell. A lot of wonderful ghosts. Yes, yes. absolutely. Heather, when and where was the first Tony ceremony? At the Waldorf Astoria um, in New York City. It was in a ballroom. Um, we weren't televised at that time. <laughs> it's a tie. <laughs> A tie. <laughs> the winners are Fiorello <laughs> Fiorello tied with the sound of music. And the first Tony Awards were a money clip for the men and a compact for the women. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when was the Tony medallion created? That came, I guess, much later. Yes, the, the Tony Award basically was, as I said, the money clip and the compact, and then came a medallion, and then, you know, a, a number of years later, and then the medallion was put on a stand, and, and then a couple of years, uh, not too long ago, we extended the, the base of the stand, so then you have the Tony that you see today, and our award is the only award that moves. <laughs> and you, you can see that people love to spin it. <laughs> <laughs> it spins. Patrick, can you describe uh, the year that James Corden was up for a Tony for One Man, Two Governors? Did something uh, go a little <laughs> amiss there? <laughs> uh, well, it didn't go amiss. It absolutely went yeah. absolutely right for James Corden. <laughs> but uh, in my conversation with him, and he's sprinkled throughout the book, uh, he was talking that he had been at the Tony Awards three times. His first time uh, with was the cast of History Boys, the year that that won the Best Play Award. He said everybody had drank uh, quite a lot prior to that. The second time was when he was nominated for One Man, Two Governors. And he said that he was at the rehearsal uh, and he was seen where he was seated, which was way back. And he noticed that Philip Seymour Hoffman, who was his <laughs> chief competitor for Death of a Salesman, was was seated right in front or near the front. So there was a techie guy there, a tech guy, uh, and he said to the tech guy, he said, well, it looks like uh, I don't have a chance. And the tech guy said, yeah, kid, you don't have a chance. You're, you're definitely going to lose. <laughs> you're, you don't have a chance. So he went home to his girlfriend, now wife, and said, I'm going to be in a state. I've got to get used to this. I'm just going to lose. I'm just going to psych myself up for losing. And then, of course, sure enough, he won. And I think in the course of the speech, and he told me this directly, he said, and that proves why nobody is a best actor or can't be a best actor. There is no such thing as back to that best actors. There's just this group of people that are distinguished that year, and I was lucky enough mm. to win that year. Two years ago, the um, Tonys were scheduled to air the night after the uh, tragedy in Orlando mm -hmm. at, the, um, at the Pulse Club, the Pulse Nightclub. 
did you consider canceling? When I arrived that morning, um, I was just alerted to the fact of what had happened. It wasn't clear, you know, what it was exactly. And as we sat in the dress rehearsal, it became very clear that something, you know, incredibly serious and, 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 and of enormous proportions had happened. And at that point, we began to talk about a lot of things. Um, canceling the broadcast, of course, you know, there was a discussion. That was not um, the main not discussion. Not really an option. It, was, it wasn't that it's not an option. It just didn't seem like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. It was really about, you know, tone and tenor and making sure that the that there was that everything was respectful and you know uplifted this mm -hmm. this situation um, and was uh, the right tone and so things like the red carpet how we conducted interviews on the red carpet things, so that was toned down well in terms of making sure that the the press knew um, you know not to focus on things of like what people are wearing that that the talent wasn't put in an uncomfortable position that the seriousness of this moment and of course you know theater is so healing and so that was the mm -hmm. reason this needed to go on and how could this telecast mm -hmm. be healing mm -hmm. and I think the main thing that happened was how James Corden opened the telecast which was about the power of theater and about the inclusivity of theater and I think that um, allowed us I think um, to hit all the right marks and it's one of my proudest moments mm -hmm. at the American Theater mm -hmm. Wing. Good evening. All around the world, people are trying to come to terms with the horrific events that took place in Orlando this morning on behalf of the whole theatre community and every person in this room. Our hearts go out to all of those affected by this atrocity. All we can say is you are not on your own right now. Your tragedy is our tragedy. Theatre is a place where every race creed, sexuality and gender is equal, is embraced and is loved. Hate will never win. Together, we have to make sure of that. Tonight's show stands as a symbol and a celebration of that principle. This is the Tony Awards. And James Corden told me for the purposes of the book that he knew that uh, just as they were about to go on the air, mm -hmm. that they had not really rehearsed that opening number entirely with the orchestra and everything else. And he knew that it would be seven minutes in whether this was going to work or if it was going to be a disaster. And he knew immediately, seven minutes in, this is going to work because of that intro. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just it doing exactly what Heather had said, mm -hmm. bringing the community together in the light of this tragedy. Mm -hmm. When senseless acts of tragedy remind us that nothing here is promised, not one day. The show is proof that history remembers. We live through times when hate and fear seem stronger. We rise and fall and light from dying embers, remembrances that hope and love last longer. And love is 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 love cannot be killed or swept aside. The wing has been led by women <laughs> since its inception. <clears throat> so going back and starting with Antoinette Perry can tell us a little bit about all of the women, including this lady right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was remarkable is that obviously a lot of people think of the, when they think of the American Theatre Wing, they think about the Tony Awards, uh, which of course they founded and co-present with the Broadway League. But what was such an honor really, and what was so exciting about this project was to go back to 1917 when Rachel Crothers, uh, who was the Neil Simon of her day, a playwright, gave the call to the th women of the, America, uh, of, the, of the American theater to meet at the Hudson Theater, the only theater owned by a woman. And the turnout was extraordinary. The Hudson Theater is still with us, it's there. Mm -hmm. um, and the women showed up and within weeks uh, they had set up sewing rooms. They had started sending packages to war tour in Europe. They were raising money. They raised seven million dollars, which is 140 million dollars today's dollars within two years. They took care of the wounded. They took care of the people coming back. They took care of refugees. They sent out two million articles of clothing. That is because the DNA was set from the beginning by strong, compassionate, intuitive women who knew how to sacrifice for their country. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, when they didn't even have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And it was when some women uh, actors could not be buried in Christian cemeteries mm -hmm. because they were actors. Mm -hmm. 
And here they responded with uh, such honor, such a degree of sacrifice, and such a degree of commitment. And the first leader of the American Theatre Wing is Rachel Crothers, uh, whose DNA really was uh, established and then followed through with four other women who are featured in the book, uh, Helen Mencken. Uh, and Antoinette Perry, for whom the Tony is named, and uh, Isabel Stevenson, who ran the theater. Mm -hmm. All of them were quirky, eccentric, committed, <laughs> passionate, <laughs> and uh, now you're seeing <laughs> <laughs> it long in the line Guilty of these as women charged. <laughs> is Heather Hitchens. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this, uh, this spiritual DNA was so exciting mm -hmm. to discover and to put in the book mm -hmm. along with these colorful, very colorful mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. Heather, tell us a little bit about the Wing's uh, uh, contribution uh, to the war effort, and specifically about the stage door canteen. Well, the, the Wing had an amazing, you know, contribution to the war effort, including, um, you know, uh, selling war bonds and, you know, sewing uniforms, and the stage door canteen, of course, which a lot of people know in New York, but also across the world, um, to entertain the troops, to give them respite. First time in the canteen, boys. Would you like to dance? Yes, ma'am, and I want a blonde, five feet three inches tall. I like a brunette, five feet two. Virginia! Yes? One blonde, five feet three inches, uh, one brunette, five feet two, for these gentlemen. Say, lady, how far can we go with these girls? <laughs> Just as far as the door, sir. <laughs> And I think one of the things that was so amazing about the Stage Door Canteen and the American Theatre Wing's women is that the Stage Door Canteen was integrated before the armed forces were integrated and before Jackie Robinson integrated baseball. And this is just that DNA, that sort of artists as thought leaders, as citizens of the field, as activists, to move the social and political needle is the through line that's throughout this book. And the Stage Door Canteen is one of the first things we see that says, wow, we're dealing with some really tough women that are going to stand for what is right. And they were criticized um, for this. They were criticized from the floor of the Senate for mongrelizing. And what their response was, which I think is important, especially in these times, was they told the, the, their response to the Senate was, go suck an egg. <laughs> <laughs> and now today we would say something a little different than that, but I think that's classy and tough. And they weren't—they weren't, they weren't going to compromise their principles on what was right. And they saw the theater and the community of the theater as a place where social change happened. And that, of course, we know to be true. But they took that so seriously and put it into action in such powerful ways. And did the was the and did the wing bring children over from England? during World War II. So that we'd be safer here, is, is that? Yes, the, yes, we did, right? yes. Um, absolutely, we did do that. And um, Angela Lansbury's mother brought Angela and her brother over. Um, her twin brother. Her sorry. twin brother mm -hmm. through the um, American Theater Wing. And then Angela studied, we gave her a scholarship to study theater, which I think worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> More than paid for herself. And she today is um, the honorary chair mm -hmm. of the American Theater. The Wing's mission uh, is certainly has expanded hmm. over the decades. Um, tell us a little bit, Heather, about the educational programs and the grants that uh, are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the Wing's mission is still about making sure that we have a pipeline of artists that can change the world through their work and their deeds, mm -hmm. and to make sure that that pipeline looks like the America that we're living in. Mm -hmm. And so all of our programs are about that, giving access to theater, giving training. Um, you know, one of the most significant programs, it's a relatively new program, is the Andrew Lloyd Webber Initiative, in which we give uh, grants to schools to help them have theater. And these are Title I schools, which otherwise would not have access to theater. We have a springboard program, which is for young actors. So once people are coughed up out of conservatory <laughs> and, thrown into the, and thrown into the world that we live in, that we give them real tools. Because there's a lot of things that you don't learn there. You know, there are a lot of connections that you don't make there. And that's what the Springboard um, program does. Um, and you know, we're, again, if you just look at all the programs, they're all about the pipeline on the stage, behind the scenes, and in the audience. 
One of the things I think we're proudest of, of the of the book, unlike any theater book or any entertainment book that's ever been written, is that really poor struggling artists and the unheralded artists share mm -hmm. equal space, equal time, both in text and in photography mm -hmm. with the rich and famous mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as well, because by the very nature of the uh, Wings programs. So I found that really exciting to talk to artists now who are really uh, struggling with pennies uh, yes. across the country. So we've talked often about a national theater and by virtue of their uh, grants and programs, we do have this national theater. Well, and I think it's everything from the awards, which are the top, you know, the Obie Awards off Broadway and the, and the Tony Awards on Broadway, to, you know, national theater company, regional, supportive regional theater company, which Lucy Arnaz was the champion of that <laughs> on our board. She helped reshape those grants and make sure that they went all across, uh, all across the country. To the Jonathan Larson you know, uh, Awards, which support young writers in musical theater, and many of those who have gone on to, to win Tony. So it's really all about that supportive um, network and making sure we have a vibrant, diverse, um, musical uh, uh, American mm. theater. And one mm. of the through lines, interestingly enough, that I discovered in the course of putting together the book is that the American Theater Wing took care of soldiers returning both from World War I and World War II and gave a lot of scholarships to Joseph yeah. Ma Joe Masteroff, who wrote Cabaret and She Loves Me, Bob Fosse, James Earl Jones, mm -hmm. Tony Bennett were all GIs that benefited from a Wing programs. And now I, was, I realized in the course of doing this book mm -hmm. that there is a program to help uh, veterans of uh, Middle Eastern wars mm -hmm. from Afghanistan mm -hmm. and Iraq continuing that recovery, that sort of rehabilitation so that writers can come into a room and share their experiences with uh, PTSD. During your tenure, certainly, Heather, at the wing, you've seen um, uh, more diversity in Broadway casts than yeah, uh, some of the, the women who had your position before? I think so. I mean, I think we have a long way to go on diversity. I, I, you uh, know, the yes. latest data that came mm -hmm. out shows that we're still 80% white. Mm -hmm. um, and that diversity, you know, needs to be addressed on the stage and behind the scenes. Um, but, but In terms of playwrights and directors. Playwrights and mm -hmm. women. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about you know, ethnic diversity, mm -hmm. but also women. Um, women mm -hmm. directors, women writers, you know, I think I think the difference is that we're living in a time, and you know, you see the stories through Fun Home and Hamilton, where these stories need to be told, and they can be told, and they can mean something to everyone, and they can be commercially viable. So it's not that it's just the right thing to do, you know, from a social justice standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's it's also good economics. These. Mm. You know, this is what we need to do. We need to tell all of our stories, that we, all of our stories make it a complete picture. It lifts, you know, it lifts us all up. And I think, you know, it's been, it's been thrilling to see Hamilton win and Fun Home win and these stories that need to be told. And I think we just, we have more work to do to make sure we're opening the doors, that we're not putting barriers, you know, in terms of casting, in terms of hiring, all of these things are things that we're deeply committed to. And, you know, we are so thrilled to have David Henry Wong mm. as our chairman. And that was a very intentional move on our part because David has been, you know, fighting for diversity and inclusion, you know, from day one. And, you know, we want to use the platform, you know, in the very best way to continue to move that needle. Mm. And David tells the story, he writes the chapter on community. Mm -hmm. And he tells the story that he was, he was out there as one of the few Asian American playwrights ever. And once somebody was putting a, a production of his play was going on, and one of the uh, uh, people involved with the production said, what are we going to put to this uh, show, chink music? Um, what? So, Yes, yes, it's in the book. It's a story that he tells in the book. But that's what David, as one of the pioneers yeah. mm. of, of this art form, had to face, as everybody does mm. in that way. Mm. But it's a, it's a great essay that he writes in the book about his experiences with diversity and community. Mm. It's also, with mm. more diversity, you're going to bring in, one would hope, the next generation of theatergoers 
Theater go to theater goers, absolutely. I mean, that's my that's my point. It's like I think there was a time in which this was always a social justice mm. conversation, and I'm all for social justice, and I think that's. But there's true. a practical but there's, side. But there, people mm. need to wake up that this is good economics. What's been mm. the most successful show in recent history? Hamilton. Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't get a more diverse and talented cast than that. And and it, and it's been embraced, and I think it's just like we can't forget these lessons, mm. and you know that happened that year uh, that it was Hamilton and Color Purple and we had this incredible confluence but it was it was a happy accident and I think you know those of us that are behind the scenes are trying to make it more intentional you know and more um, you know normal regular that you know that it happens not just when the content happens yeah one of the yeah. exciting things about it too was by virtue of the grants that they give out in this specific instant a Jonathan Larson grant and that was a lot of the artists that I talked to said they never thought they had a place in the mm -hmm. theater, specifically David Malloy. Mm -hmm. David Malloy had no interest in the theater until he got a Jonathan Larson grant just by Googling uh, grants in New York. And he was able to pay the rent with that and suddenly found a place in the theater. That came up a lot in my talks, in my talk with artists. It was that I never sort of thought I had a place in the theater until I got this grant. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the access <laughs> to the opportunity. One of our Andrew Lloyd Webber scholars, you know, was a, is a senior going, uh, going into her senior year of high school. She discovered lighting design which is amazing, you know, to have a woman lighting design of color. Um, and, and she wanted to go to NYU for an intensive, that, and it cost $11,000. And she said, you know, my family didn't have the money to do it. And she said, so I just applied for it. And then I started Googling scholarships. And, the, and, and she said, I got accepted, and I thought, oh, I'm not going to be able to go. And the Andrew Lloyd Webber scholarship came up, and she applied to it. So that's the, the, those are the kind of barriers that I'm talking about that we need to keep working on. I, I should add that Dave Malloy uh, created uh, Natasha Pierre in The Great Comedy. Yeah. Yes, right. right. Yeah. You described the book as a love story. In what <laughs> way is it a love story? I think it's a love story of people for, uh, for their, their uh, community, uh, for their art if it's not too pretentious word, mm -hmm. uh, and also for their country. Yes. Mm. I think that was the big revelation in this post-2016 election season where we are so divided that in my interviews with contemporary artists today creating in this time, they were most anxious to reach across the divide. Mm -hmm. They weren't interested in being polemical. They weren't interested in sharing what their opinions were. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know what the other opinions were and to reach across the divide. Mm -hmm. I really felt, that you certainly felt in the two world wars, a love and a patriotic love of mm -hmm. this country, yes. but it's not diminished. No. It's, it's not diminished. It's, it's stronger than ever. And it was great mm -hmm. to be reminded of that now. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely true, and and I think the thing that, you know, is important to say about this book is certainly a book about the history of theater. Mm -hmm. It is certainly a book about the history of the American theater wing, but it is also a book about American history yes. and women's history, mm -hmm. and you know, and I think that makes the case of what you're saying is that you know, and uh, the emotional tie, and that that that, that what people loved it was their love for their country, love for their art form. Yes and a desire to give back. You mm. see it, you know, all the way from the, the founding women to Andrew Lloyd Webber to Rosie O'Donnell who talks about in the preface about putting kids in the velvet. And, you know, and that her greatest hope- She means in the seats. Right. <laughs> and her greatest hope um, is that one of those kids, you know, beyond, you know, lids of productive light might walk on stage at the Tonys and thank the American Theater Wing because she put them in the velvet. Yeah. So that sacrifice, you know, just being able to put a highlight on the important role that artists play in our society, because I think we've lost that a little bit. We've lost yeah. that. Where do we look for leadership? We look at the work. What are, what are the writers trying to tell us? What are we trying to explore? Yeah. And through their deeds and as thought leaders, and I think that's what this reminds us of, that we haven't lost that. We just don't look to it for mm -hmm. the answers as much as we once did. What is the Wing's mission and what your mission is of, for going forward in this century? I think we have to keep telling these stories because I think what we've seen through the history, we have to say yes to artists and we have to let them tell their stories, make it possible for them to tell the stories. It's about keeping the essential role that artists play 
in helping us move forward as a society. And that's by recognizing it at certain times, it's by funding it at certain times, it's about bringing recognition to it through awards and through a telecast. But that is the mission, is to, is to empower the artist to lead us out. And it takes Thanks. courage. Yeah. Heather's last chapter, uh, this is the fifth chapter, is looking forward mm -hmm. in the chapter. And the basic text of that is that courage is infectious. In what way do you think that the Broadway, that Broadway has changed, not so much about what's on stage, but just the community itself? You know, I, I I don't know that it's changed so much. I think that it's a it's a it's a family. It's a you know mm -hmm. people you know it's it's true it's a family. But we eat our young. <laughs> 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 we are a community and a family drawn together by these core values mm -hmm. of what the power of live theater can do. Mm -hmm. And I think that hasn't changed mm -hmm. over the many many years. But as Heather said, at the end of the day you come together to create the best piece of art that you possibly can, and when the exterior world intrudes, whether it's 9-11 or AIDS mm -hmm. or Orlando, mm -hmm. uh, theater people come together in a way that mm -hmm. is really admirable, no question. Heather, thank you so much thank for being you. with us. And your book, absolutely marvelous. This is the, this is the book to give <laughs> this Christmas, the holidays. <laughs> coming up because everything you want to know about the theater is in this book and especially about the wing. Thank you for thank your you. insightful questions. Well, it's always good to be with you. And thank you for watching and we'll see you next time for Spotlight on Broadway.